I just want to say welcome to everyone and thank you for coming to our second ABE teacher roundtable discussion. And as some of you may know, this is a brand new series for us this year. It started last year with our ABE Master Teacher Fellows program. And it was sort of a unique opportunity that we provided just for our fellows. And um, this year, we really thought it was a great opportunity with so many people being virtual and trying to connect virtually that it was something we would like to open up to our entire ABE teacher community. So we're just happy to have you with us and we're happy that you're interested in this topic. And so um, the way that these work is that we usually, I'll briefly introduce our, our guest presenter today and then Alyssa will talk us through some of the um, some of the content and questions surrounding culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogy in the science classroom. And then we'll have some time for you all to ask questions and to interact with one another. If we have a small group, which it looks like we do today, um, then we'll probably just um, have some discussion in the chat room itself. And I wanna say a special thank you to Ashley Young, who's joining us from the Amgen Foundation. So thank you for making time for being here today, Ashley. Good to have you. So on that note, next slide, please. Um, oh, I think we're missing our intro slide that I had for Alyssa. So um, I will just have to talk off the top of my head, which is to let you know that Alyssa is, uh, a, we're proud to have her as a member of the ABE program office. She's an evaluator and an instructional coach, and she specializes in culturally responsive evaluation and supporting school systems with professional learning in the areas of culturally responsive teaching, instructional design, and technology integration. She's got 14 years of urban education experience, and her current research focuses on culturally responsive teaching with technology. And one of the reasons we're especially excited to have her here with us is that Alyssa is working with us at the program office to really think about how we develop our curriculum, how we develop our professional learning resources, and how are we actually modeling with our own materials the kinds of culturally responsive instruction that we would like to see. Um, so what I'll do if it's okay, Alyssa, why don't I just go ahead and start sharing mine and you can just say next slide if that works for you. That does. Okay, so give me a second to start sharing because okay. I am so smooth at this stuff, you will just not believe. Um, so here you can all see Alyssa on your video and here on the slide. And so uh, at this point, I'm just gonna turn it over to Alyssa to kick us off. And you just prompt me, Alyssa, when you're ready to move. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. I think I had a different version up. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, I am excited that you're here. I am coming to you from Chicago, um, Illinois, and um, thanks, Jess, for introducing me, and thanks for our um, Amgen family that's with us, and um, thanks for everyone that's that's here today and um, virtually. So um, we are going to start off kind of laying the foundation for why we're here. And uh, next slide, please. So today we are going to, I'm gonna give you kind of an high, a high level overview of um, grounding us in culturally responsive and culturally sustaining pedagogy. We're gonna look at um, how that undergirds the curriculum. And then we're going to look at um, what does that mean for us in the science classroom? Um, and then we're gonna talk really and ask some questions. And so that's kind of the journey that we are that we are going on with the end being that we really want to talk about how we can support you more, how we can support your, um, your sites and, and get resources to your program office and, and really uh, support you as best we can. So um, starting off, um, one of the, the things that's important in grounding us is recognizing that there are individuals that have been doing this work um, for years. And um, this is just a, a, a sampling um, of some of the great researchers, scholars, teacher practitioners that um, have informed the work that I am currently doing and um, the research that I've been embarked on. And so um, we've got Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, we've got Dr. Uh, Paris Alim, um, we've got, uh, excuse me, Dr. Uh, Django Paris, we have um, Dr. Chris Emden, we have um, Dr. Chris uh, Rich Milner, we have Zaretta Hammond, and we have Dr. Geneva Gay. And there are many more. Next slide, please. 
Um, also grounding us is the awareness that we are coming to you um, from a US-based context. And we know that um, uh, ABE's programming spans um, many countries, it spans around the world. And that when we talk about broadening participation, um, we're talking about it in relation to this context. However, um, when we really think about the idea of what culture is and what cultural dimensions are, um, they're really, you know, they're, there's a wide continuum. And so um, when we talk about broadening, um, underrepresentation looks different in different contexts, right? So we might be talking about um, racial and ethnic. Um, oh, there's a note in here. Yes, yes, Rich Miller is amazing. When we talk about um, racial and ethnic differences um, in other countries, we might be talking about language differences. We might be talking about belief systems and religious difference, differences. And so as we talk today, there's gonna be hopefully some direct application and some direct overlap. However, um, some of the things that we discussed today may not apply in your unique context. And so just grounding us there. Next slide, please. Okay, so what you have here is um, a culture tree, and it is from the work of um, Soretta Hammond. And it's just a really beautiful representation to remind us that students are coming into our classroom, and we're coming into our classroom, classrooms and learning environments, um, really with, with different dimensions of culture with us. And so in this tree, you have kind of um, the deep, deep culture, right? And um, when we talk about building relationships and building trust and understanding who's with us and what they're bringing with us, we have different levels. So we've got kind of that deep unconscious beliefs and norms on what guides our decision-making, what guides our uh, beliefs about ourselves, um, our spiritual beliefs. Um, we've got uh, what she calls a shallow culture, which is things like our concept of time, right? Um, how we display emotion, how we handle emotion, um, when we come in, how do we um, interact in terms of even things like making eye contact, right? And then we have our service culture, which is um, our um, things we know that are directly observable, right? Um, the games that we play, the way that we walk, the way that the dance that we engage in, even the type of literature that we read, how we talk and interact in the classroom, um, as well as um, things like you know, the food that we eat. And so really just wanted to make sure that um, that we're acknowledging all of these differences. And so we will move on to the next slide. I'll hold on a second. Okay. Um, this slide is really meant to, um, to ground us in acknowledging um, the work that's been done over these so many years, right? We've got um, 40 years in the making. And um, what you'll see at the top are really theoretical and conceptual models um, around culturally responsive and now culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogy. But really, um, years ago, it, uh, we saw different terms, right? So we've seen culturally relevant, we've seen culturally appropriate. Um, and uh, in the early 80s, we had um, Al, who was doing research around um, reading and what is culturally appropriate reading, um, looking at students in, in Hawaii and looking at um, matching reading styles with um, instructional practices, all the way till we've got culturally relevant pedagogy, culturally responsive. Um, and even now we have uh, this idea of culturally sustaining pedagogy, which we'll get into a little bit more um, in the upcoming slides. Um, and more recently, our abolitionist teaching um, and, and even Dr. Goldie Muhammad's work. And undergirding that, um, simultaneously, we wanna think about this idea of not just pedagogy, but um, what is, how does that inform the curriculum that we develop? And so there are different models that we wanted to lift up here, one of which we'll talk about really briefly, which is um, Banks model. And so um, Banks really looks at um, curriculum through a multicultural lens. Um, uh, Gorski's model is very similar um, and really takes, again, an equity focus, but a lot of his work is informed by um, Banks as well. Um, and then 
uh, Harris Ford's Bloom's Banks matrix is really connected with this idea of the Bloom's taxonomy, which a lot of teachers use here in the States, this idea of the levels of thinking and, and um, how our instructional practices are connected with that. And so it's an, an amazing model that um, connects Banks' work with that. Next slide, please. Um, and so we're gonna take a minute and just pause. Um, I want you to take a look at this, um, this picture. Um, and then I'm gonna read this quote. And as I'm reading it, I want you to just kind of think about it and then throw your, your immediate thoughts in the chat. Uh, what does this resonate with you? And so when we think about the curriculum that we develop, the school curriculum communicates what we choose to remember about our past, what we believe about our present, and what we hope for in the future. So in thinking about that quote, um, if everyone that is willing and able and feels okay with it, if you could um, just throw in the chat, uh, what, what is that quote, um, what does it bring up for you? What resonates with you? Or what are your thoughts or your wonderings when you see that quote? And I'll take a minute and pause. Are there good, bad answers? Because Oh, there's no have... there and come on off mute. Yes. So there's a range of there's a range of answers. So there's no pres there's no prescription here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen, for sharing. Others? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Lisa, maybe you could read some of them aloud as we're recording. So, oh, absolutely. Um, so can hear what some of what's in the chat. Absolutely. I love that. So this image um, depicts pillage and rape to me, of the North American continent that was shared by Karen. Um, Jess, you shared, I remember seeing this painting in school, never really thinking twice about it as a white woman. Now it jumps, um, it jumps out. The white woman uh, is overarching over everyone else um, and dominating over Native Americans on the ground. Um, and then Lisa's comment is really talking about that the teacher has to realize their own bias. And then Ashley is sharing, I love this quote, and for me, Rosalind Franklin comes to mind. So thanks very much for everyone sharing your thoughts. And um, absolutely, absolutely. And what is she holding, right? What is she holding? All right, uh, next slide, please. And so what we have here is the, uh, is the James A. Banks um, model really for transforming curriculum. And there are four levels and uh, we're gonna kind of go through them um, quickly, but this is a model that we're using um, in our own internal processes and, and looking at um, one, uh, does the design of curriculum, two, what is embedded kind of underneath it and what is our thinking, and then um, what exists right now and where are we going? And so if we could start off with our first, um, next slide, please. So the first level is what Banks refers to as the contribution contributions approach. And this is kind of our base level. And um, base as in nothing absolutely wrong with it. It is a great starting point. But it really talks about this idea of um, heroes on holidays, right? Kind of integrating and putting on top of what we already do, um, things that we can celebrate, things that might be great for us. Um, and in the U.S. context, uh, we see this done um, starting off in our early primary uh, years. But we see it other places as well. So um, our next level is this idea of, hmm, we don't just have these heroes and holidays, but maybe we'll integrate a book. Maybe we'll integrate um, a course. Maybe we'll add something on top of what we already center and value and believe to be the most important. And neither of these really um, challenges the basic structure of what we believe our curriculum should be um, or who it should represent. Next slide, please. So the next level is really our transformational approach. 
And this is where we start to see this um, critical thinking, this integration of um, different perspectives, different points of view, looking at um, history through different lenses. Um, you can have an event that's happened um, and it can really be, uh, it can resonate with different groups of people in lots of different ways. And so acknowledging that and, and pulling those things apart and critically looking at um, all those things and integrating them and um, not just looking at curriculum as in this is what we're doing you're going to add something into it but really saying that curriculum should be representative of different view viewpoints different perspectives different individuals and those are my dog those are my dog babies that you hear if you hear them in the background I want to acknowledge them because if they come up you know that's what we got going on. So next slide, please. And I think, well, I'm gonna just throw it in. The, the, last, um, the last level is really our social action. And that's really where students are um, looking at problems that are happening in their environment. Um, they are uh, designing for solving those problems. They are agentic. Um, they are um, connecting what they're learning with what's happening in their community and in their environment. Social action. Yes, yes. So let, our last level is social action. So we're going to pause because I've been talking for a little while right now, um, kind of doing this high level overview of um, kind of grounding us. But we want to we want to pause for a minute. And we want to begin engaging and asking some questions. And Jess, um, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Oh, Amy is amazing. She is um, doing all the background stuff that's so important to make everything keep moving. Um, so there is a Padlet that is in the chat. And you're welcome to uh, look at the QR, QR code um, that you can scan. Or you can click on the link. And for those of you all that um, are familiar with Padlet, um, fantastic. For those of you all that are not, it is an online notepad. And essentially, you open it up, you click, and um, you type right into it. I'll just also invite everyone who, um, if this is a nice small group, so we weren't sure if we'd actually have the luxury of doing this, but if you'd like, you can just unmute and sort of say, what is your initial response to this question? Um, and, and I'm happy to kind of kick that off first while folks are writing, which is to say, um, this was really kind of, um, again, as I, I, I learned to teach in a particular, through a particular lens, and that was just the way things were taught. And so for me, this idea of a culturally responsive curriculum, I didn't know what it was instead of, because there was only one thing kind of curriculum that occurred to me. And so over the years, um, I, I keep sort of adding to my understanding of what different lenses might be represented or might be left out of the curriculum. And um, every time I think, oh, okay, I've got it, then I find out there's another perspective missing. And so um, for me, it matters because our students we know have these growing gaps in, in access and opportunity and um, particularly in STEM, we think about their STEM identity, and I'll save that for later, but um, they're forming their identities in the classroom. And so how they're engaging with curriculum and what they're being asked to engage with has a huge impact on them as students. So, so that's why I think it really matters from my perspective as a teacher and working for the PO. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Others, if you can just come off mute or if you want to type something in the chat, um, why does culturally responsive curriculum matter? Um, in your uh, environment and in schools today? Alyssa, um, I'm not a teacher and I don't have training in teaching. Um, and so I'm just learning about all of this for the first, you know. So I'm wondering, you know, we look at science and we look at it as very, you know, it, you know, you have a right answer and you have a wrong answer. It's very, how do I say it, very objective lots of times. And so I'm very curious, how do we bring this? We want to reach out to more schools. Our program originally, just teachers who were interested, wanted to do the program, that's great. So typically, um, you know, minority students and lower income schools were not included in our program because they didn't reach out to come to us. But we're working hard to reach out to them now. And so 
I, I want to know how do we get the students invested in this information in this program that we have. Um, you know, the kids that are attending in their AP bio and they're going to college and all that, they have reasons why this is relevant for them. But for perhaps younger students or students that have never thought about these things before, they may even be in high school and they've never been exposed to it. How do we get them invested and, I, I, and relate to them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love, I love that you are coming in not as an educator because it, it really reminds us that there is a village of um, different professionals, different organizations, different community members that can be just as invested as um, you know the the folks that we see in the schools or you know are, are out of school learning. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that engagement um, as well. That piece that you mentioned. How do we get how do we connect with folks that normally um, would not have access, maybe you know, from being economically disadvantaged, um, historically minoritized? And so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna keep going. Are there others before we move on that wanna come off mute or type something in the chat? Okay. We are going to keep on moving. So another thing that we wanted to uh, that we wanted to center is that, and my babies are just talking to Amazon people, okay, but we're going to keep on moving. Um, so we wanted to center that um, when we talk about culturally responsive, culturally sustaining, culturally relevant um, teaching, that lab exchange um, has um, a racial diversity, equity, inclusion, and science classrooms initiative. And it is not up right now. It is not up right now, but it will be up and running. And there are several things that they are looking at um, in terms of creating this inclusive and racist um, teaching classroom. And so um, they're looking at things like um, how racism um, informs this idea of what an quote unquote ideal scientist is. They're looking at representation. They're looking at um, allyship and in inclusivity and in teaching. Um, we're looking at cultivating growth mindset. We're looking at um, structural bias, individual bias, um, and of course what we're talking about today. And so Jess, did you wanna say a little bit more about that or? Yeah, I'll just say a little bit, which is that this is this project is really exciting, and it's another one that um, has been funded by the Amgen Foundation. And so, as you can see, there's a lot of connections across their programmatic work. And so, for teachers, um, especially ABE teachers, if you are already on Lab Exchange, as soon as these resources become available, you'll have access to these clusters and pathways that will be created for you. And so, some of them are for you as a teacher or educator to learn, and some of them are for your students. Um, and so those are in development right now, but we, we have included the link there and I know Amy's pasted it in the chat. So you can check it out, which tells you a little bit more about the project itself, but we wanted to mention it here because Lab Exchange does partner with ADE. And so many of you, especially in the past couple of years have been using Lab Exchange to um, supplement your classroom teaching and the way that you're approaching ABE labs. So we thought it was just a really nice kind of, um, these are some nice assets that will help you as educators think about these questions and, um, beyond this round table. Thanks, Alyssa. Yep, next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about um, what, what is it? What is culturally responsive and sustaining um, um, teaching? Um, how do we know it when we see it, right? And um, culturally responsive and sustaining, uh, sustaining practices um, really help teachers and educators um, understand the backgrounds that students are bringing in and using this knowledge to design effective learning experiences um, that will yield to academic success. And Karen, to your point of engaging students as well, right? Next slide. Um, they also uh, acknowledge the, uh, the differences that students are bringing in, all the diversity that they're bringing in. Um, they're affirming to students, they value students in all their different identities. Um, and more importantly, um, these practices 
really purpose to dismantle these inequities in education. And so a couple minutes ago talked about um, what is the difference kind of between culturally responsive teaching and culturally sustaining um, teaching? Really what we're looking at here is um, examining, hey, are we keeping the structures as they exist or are we breaking down those structures and really asking ourselves, what are we seeking to sustain? Are we um, uh, building classrooms where, where uh, students can come in and exist at all the different intersections that they come in? Or are we um, uh, reducing or removing or um, not acknowledging, not valuing? And so we wanna make sure that um, what we create in the way of curriculum, that it is sustainable, that it's not a something we just do on top of. And this is great. This is a trend. This is something that's really cool. And then we go back to doing everything the way that we used to do it. Um, and also uh, wanted to, to bring up that um, culturally responsive and sustaining practices, um, really they um, sustain this idea of multilingualism, right? Bringing in all the different um, languages, multiculturalism, and really looking at equitable outcomes. And it's important to center that equitable outcomes. If we are integrating heroes and holidays and celebrations, are those things leading to equitable outcomes? Or are those things creating um, wonderful classroom environments? But we're not, um, we're not dism dismantling these inequities in education and looking at who is being served. I see a, a note in the chat. Oh, okay, Lisa, fantastic. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are gonna start talking. We are gonna move towards, okay, we've got some grounding here. What does this mean for us in the science classroom? And so um, I'm gonna ask for some feedback um, from folks that are out there. Either you can unmute or you can put your notes in the chat. Um, you're welcome to think a little bit more and, and um, put some things in the Padlet later if you'd like as well. But um, our first question is, what makes um, CRP and science different? And Karen, you mentioned one thing about either, you know, it's pretty objective, right? Um, others, if you want to add, or um, Karen, too, if you want to add a little bit more, but I'm going to pause and um, allow folks to to give us some feedback. Oh, I held on this one in the earlier question, Alyssa, but um, I know one of the things that we've been grappling with, uh, you know, at the program office has been this, this sort of sense that science is neutral. Um, as Karen was talking about earlier, when she said, you know, there's a right answer, there's a wrong answer, it's factual, you know, that somehow science is just science. And so what does it mean to be culturally responsive? Well, when that's what we've been trained to believe science is. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, and so thinking instead about, you know, the many, many ways it's not neutral, um, the whole, um, the stories that we tell about science, the way that science has been derived, the stories that have been centered in how we teach science, all of those things, and again, this is kind of the, you know, when you, it feels like you've almost had a veil lifted off once you realize um, that you, what you haven't seen in the curriculum. So this idea that there's a myth that science is neutral, and we, we've been doing some really interesting reading of some of the research in this area, um, but it's been, it's been helping us think about how do we help teachers teach science in a way that acknowledges that it's not neutral. And what kind of, but that raises the question of what do teachers need to do that kind of teaching? You know, what kind of tools or resources will help them do that? Um, which is why I'm kind of excited to hear from teachers about that question. Exactly, Lisa, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, just lifting up in the chat, um, Lisa made a comment, um, where, where do we get examples, right? Of, of what integration looks like and that there, there have been trainings about the why but where do we go to access these perspectives, right, uh, with science? And, and one of the, the great things that we're gonna do today is we're gonna look at some of these, some of these examples. Um, and yes, 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 we are doing some of this work. We are um, working on curating resources to share. We have some really great, um, even in our monthly newsletters, we put out um, resources where we say, hey, 
these are some things that folks are doing and we link out to the research. We also link to what um, our other AB sites are doing so that folks can begin to see. Um, and then another thing that we're doing, and, and Jess can maybe speak to this a little bit more, is that we are um, building professional learning communities, right? So that folks can begin to share kind of on the ground um, what they're beginning to do, um, what we're seeing, in addition to what we see in the research. And we know that research, um, you know, it, 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 it might be a year or two behind, right? And so we want to have, um, we definitely want to have a, a balance. Jess, did you want to speak to that as well? But I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Yeah, I mean, I think we can talk more about it too in a minute, but I would say that um, your question's a great one, Lisa, because this is where we kind of get stuck, is that I get the idea in the abstract, but as a teacher, so what? What do I do with that? What can I use? Where can I go? And so um, what we've been doing is focusing at a few different levels. We're, we're really focusing on, um, as we develop curriculum resources like the cystic fibrosis pocket lesson that we'll talk about in a minute, but also the, the kind of materials you as a teacher would have um, available to you through your PDI. So when you went to a professional development institute with other ABE teachers, this is part of what you'd be talking about and sharing. So you would be using some reflection questions to look at lessons you're teaching and think about how you can adapt them um, together. Um, and we would be providing program sites with some tools that they could use with you, their teacher community, um, in those professional development sessions. Um, and another really great resource that I'm probably jumping ahead too much here, but a great resource is um, our Master Teacher Fellows. Uh, we've only had one year of that program so far, but our fellows last year developed some absolutely amazing uh, curriculum projects. And at least three of them um, focused specifically on these practices and how they could change up some of their science lessons so that it infused more of the history of science. It asked more questions about identity, about um, sort of the narrative, the deficit versus asset narrative. So those resources are going to be up probably within the next couple of weeks. And so those will be there for you too. Um, but those were questions they were really thinking about very explicitly as they developed their projects. So we're, we're slowly gathering some steam, but um, they're coming your way. And I also know there are lots of other great organizations um, and we'd be happy to follow up with everyone who's on the call to just share some organizations who have done some great work in this area with classroom resources available. Fantastic. All right, next slide. And, and I think we're gonna go into, we'll go into this a little bit more so we can, um, we can go ahead and get started um, with, well, what does it look like? right? Um, where might we integrate? What does integration look like? And so um, in our first example, we're really looking at um, designing for problem solving and more specifically problem solving in the real world with um, issues and, and problems that students and their families are facing. And we'll get into this a little bit more when we look at our example, our most uh, recent ABE example. Um, but when we think about um, the planning and we look at our goals and our, and our objectives, yes, we want them to be aligned to our science standards, but really coupling that with this social change agency and not just designing for the problems that we believe are most important, but really what are the problems that are linked with our students and their communities and their families? And, and in doing that, really doing some of that digging and finding out, you know, where do these, what's the context that these problems exist in and making sure that we're bringing up um, the historical context, make sure we're accurate, make sure we're talking um, about the different dimensions um, in which these problems exist. And so from a design-based perspective, when we design, are we designing um, through that lens? So one way. Uh, next slide, please. We're gonna go over kind of a few different options, okay? The next thing that we can consider is really looking at our lessons through multiple perspectives. Um, and one of the examples that we pulled up here is if we were investigating food deserts, for example, looking at um, the different communities from which they live, um, maybe coupling that with our social determinants of health, really looking at, um, and we'll look at this with, with uh, our um, cystic fibrosis example in just a minute, really, and really go through some more of these dimensions. Um, yes, using examples from the local community, um, and then also connecting um, the problems that we're examining in our course, connecting them with 
um, underrepresented individuals out in the real world. And it might sound like, well, hey, I don't know, you know, X many scientists. Well, maybe you might know um, a couple of people who might connect you with a couple more people, and maybe we can begin to build some of those resources as well. Um, so that students are looking and saying, hey, I'm addressing this problem, and now I am presenting my problem, uh, my solution to the problem to a real authentic audience. And it can be done low tech, high tech, with photos, um, online, using um, forums. And we also know that across the different um, ABE sites that there's different regulations that are in place in terms of you know, you can take pictures, you can't take pictures, all of those different things. But the concept is really about um, intentionally integrating the work that we're, that we're doing and connecting it with an authentic audience. Next slide, please. Okay, and so now we're going to talk about um, our um, cystic fibrosis example that we um, kind of broke down in our ABE module. So just to give you a little bit of grounding, uh, we start off this module, we look at a young lady in UK, and she is battling with cystic fibrosis. And she talks about her experience, she does a video, um, she looks at, you know, you begin to look at what her routines are and, and really get um, um, the idea is to really ground the work in that it's not just work, that there are people behind uh, what we're doing. And so in taking the lens of using this same module, we looked at, well, in the U.S., we're really looking at African-American, Latinx, Hispanic communities and broadening participation that way. And um, how could we take the same, how, oh, thank you, Jess, for sharing that um, blog. And uh, we have a whole blog about it, but um, how could we take the unit that we have right now and really kind of um, look at it through a culturally responsive lens? So one of the things that we could do is examine the idea of, well, wait a second, if we're looking at um, diseases and we're looking at cystic fibrosis as one example, we could um, pause and say, hmm, which diseases um, affect the communities that we're engaged with the most. So if we were looking at Latinx, Hispanic, and, and African Americans, we might decide to um, do some research on Alzheimer's disease, for example, right? Um, we also might look at how many young people in these certain groups are most impacted because um, cystic fibrosis um, impacts those of European descent at a much, much, much higher rate than the other communities that we are um, seeking to connect with. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're engaging in that way. Um, also, we could couple this lesson by looking at um, historical health uh, disparities and looking at quality health care and specifically looking at genetic diseases. Um, also, we could do some more research in terms of um, looking at um, publicly available research about these genetic diseases that are impacting these communities. Um, and then on a real practical level, we can look at our modeling and um, begin to look at how the visuals that we are using and the concepts that we're explaining, how we are, we are integrating um, reference that our, that our students are familiar with. When, when I say reference, right? So if we're looking at um, tree diagrams um, and looking at genetic diseases, we might decide to use um, different uh, different models that maybe our students could talk about their, uh, maybe the names of the different genes are uh, connected with our students' families. Um, maybe we're having our students demonstrate their understanding um, by creating visuals that really connect with their community. Um, maybe we could um, integrate ways for our students to use um, our different levels of language, i.e. explaining concepts by way of video, explaining concepts by way of maybe creating even a storyboard. Why am I bringing these, these things out to bear? Because it's not just the content that we're talking about, but it's the content in the medium that we're used to um, talking about it with, and it's our connecting with students and their critical thinking in ways that can then that can connect with them. And so those are just a couple of the things that um, can be really intentional that we can do from a real practical 
grounds on hands in the classroom um, viewpoint, as well as from a larger design-based um, uh, perspective. And I hope I wasn't talking too fast um, there, but I know we're a little tight on time. All right, are there any questions for that folks have right now that you wanna, that you wanna ask? You can unmute and ask in, in the moment right now. And then while I'm giving a minute, I'm gonna look in the chat. Okay, okay, no questions? Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is another example when you say like, my goodness, what does this look like? Um, this is an, an article by um, um, Fakayode and um, Otu, Otulaje, excuse me. Um, if you're out there, grace and mercy. Um, but really this, um, this research article is really talking about this idea of building models using um, cultural reference, i.e. beads. And I thought it was an amazing um, resource to bring up, especially because it talks about this idea of not just using beads like hair beads, but really choosing colors that are grounded in um, students' um, cultural experiences. So using colors from the flag, using um, colors that are important to them emotionally, even spiritually. And so as you're building, you, you're taking into account that we that students are gonna be engaging and saying, hey, these are the colors that we're using. We can still talk about the concepts, the science concepts, but um, giving students a way for them to connect with their culture that's important to them and also integrating it with the science concept, concepts. Next slide, please. All right. So this is our last example, and um, I'm hoping that we can get some folks to kind of jump in a little bit more. But what we have is uh, it's another piece of research, and really it was about um, specifically two um, high school teachers, um, and uh, they were um, engaging in you know bioinformatics, and uh, they were doing the same lesson. And um, I wanted to present kind of what they they were doing in terms of um, seeking to be more culturally responsive. And so um, we've got our Sarah and Clara. And um, Sarah um, really anchored her classroom conversations in current events. And um, she was doing a lesson on um, really health disparities. And um, she started talking to her students about um, the air quality. And more specifically, she talked to them about um, problems in their environment connected to uh, an oil refiner refinery that was there. And she talked about all the different variables that were connected with this idea of um, air quality. And she also asked um, students to think about um, who was most impacted by this oil refinery, um, whose health um, uh, outcomes were most desperate. And she also asked them, um, how does what their learning um, connect with their own experiences. And so that was our Sarah. Um, Clara did, the, did a very similar lesson and um, she introduced this idea of asthma. She talked about air quality and um, the effectiveness of the different things that are happening to address air quality. And she asked her students to um, share some personal stories about um, things that they'd experienced, right? When they went to the doctor in terms of getting healthcare. Um, and she, yes, and we are gonna share the slide deck. She also um, uh, made sure that as she was going through her lessons, when she was asking her students from an instructional standpoint, that she made sure not to give them direct answers, right? Um, and she did this all with the perspective of, I wanna make sure that um, I am capturing my students' interest. And so my question to you before we move forward is, if you were from this brief snapshot um, to think about who you think was most um, effective in terms of the outcomes, science outcomes, um, who would you say? Would you say you think Sarah was most effective um, with this lesson or do you think Clara was most effective with this lesson? 
and I will pause and look in the chat or you can unmute and tell me what you think. No takers? I can jump in. Come on. Oh, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, it seems like um, Sarah's approach is a bit more traditional and Clara's could be a setup for project-based learning in a way that students are exploring things that matter to them. Um, and so I feel like Clara is leaning more towards that social action level. Thank you, appreciate it, appreciate it. Thanks for coming off mute. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Okay, let's go on to our next slide. Oh, let me back up, sorry. Um, so um, actually, Sarah was most effective. And, um, but when I first read it, I thought, wow, I think Claire is doing some really good things, right? And so towards the end of this, this article and its reference here, um, they talked about the difference between what um, made Sarah's really more impactful in terms of the outcomes. And the biggest, um, the bigger factors were really that she was looking at and exposing her students to complex variables in the environment. So she was saying, hey, this is a problem. We know that air quality is a problem. What are all the different variables that interact with that problem? And then how can we take those variables and look at how those variables interact with your own experiences? And then she linked all of those things to the concepts that she was talking about in class. And so um, it was very, very surprising for me because I thought, wow, Claire is really interested in what her students are thinking. She's encouraging them to think about their healthcare experiences, but really it was Sarah who was saying, yes, we wanna talk about these healthcare experiences, but we wanna look at, so that, that um, I guess what we would call um, high academic expectations, um, coupled with using the science concepts, coupled with um, having the students kind of look at how all of that relates to their lives. All right, let's keep going. And I am cognizant of, of time. So we wanted to um, make, make sure that we paused to connect with you all and ask, um, how are you um, embedding culturally responsive and sustaining practices into what you're doing? Um, what have you tried already? Um, even if it's not, as I like to tell um, Jess, even if it's not a fully baked cake, if it doesn't have icing and sprinkles and all that stuff on it, um, what have you tried? And really giving some time for you to, um, to talk about these things and um, to ask questions. Hey, I've tried this, or hey, I'm thinking about this. Um, like, what do you think? What is happening? So I'm going to pause and, and um, I'm going to invite um, everyone that's here that's willing to share a little bit about what you've done, what you'd like to do, or maybe what you've seen. Yay, Lisa, you're visible. We're so happy Hi. to have you. <laughs> <laughs> um, on Zoom, it was a little tough, but uh, when we got to our viruses and immune unit in my uh, freshman bios class, I started off asking, you know, why don't people get vaccinated and just let people kind of chime in um, their opinions. And most classes don't think about the, the mistrust in the, the medical community. So, um, you know, having a discussion about the Tuskegee syphilis study and, um, you know, the forced sterilization, Henrietta Lacks, um, 
there are years when we actually read that book in, in the class, which is just such a great examination of bioethics and how we've come to be where we are today. Um, so it's unfortunate that we don't have time like this year, just playing catch up from the learning loss to read the novel Henrietta Lacks, but that's such a great book. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for sharing, um, Lisa. And what you're bringing to bear is something that um, we need to continue to lift up because some science teachers might say, you know, I'm not an English teacher. You know, I'm not going to read. Why are we reading this? And um, I love that, that really you're engaging in that, you know, uh, that bioethics. And um, it's a thing. It's been a thing. And going into the field, um, even when we think about what you just brought up, which is um, um, COVID vaccinations, right? That it's, it's not so simple as, you know, this is what the science and um, community says, but really acknowledging that historical um, and that cultural and, and political context and that it does impact um, the field and it impacts um, kiddos and, and their families. I really appreciate you bringing up um, that example and that you're saying that, hey, we didn't have time and thinking about that um, when we are pressed, right? And we have, com we have like competing um, priorities, right? How do, we, um, how do we wrestle with that? And how do we begin to think about um, what integration looks like um, in, you know, in these times right now? And we want to continue to talk about this um, so that it's not kind of a, I want to do it, but I can't. We want to think about what it could look like. Others? Karen, I'd love to hear from you if you're able, because you were saying you're trying to bring this into ADE Greater well, Los Angeles I, a little more. I just more. think we should because we're reaching out to these communities. And Lisa brought up a very good point because I was thinking, when I was talking about getting the students invested these in, in the subject matter, but do they traditionally have sort of a, um, I'm sorry, I'm off video because my Wi-Fi is deciding to act up. Um, do they have sort of a, a cultural um, distrust of science, particularly medical science, so that that would keep them from investing in this material that we want to teach them, you know, because it's very important. It has healthcare issues for them. It has job opportunities for them. And so we need to address that head on before we can even go into the science or they won't be interested. They'll just be sitting back in their chair not listening. I love that. And I love that you, um, that you brought that up, that um, these are entry points and acknowledging these, um, not as a, um, it's a political thing, but at, that it's an, a, an imperative in the field. And that not doing that is really going to be um, kind of doing the same thing. We talked about that sameness and we talked about kind of keeping things the way that they have been. What does that mean? What does that mean for us um, for um, when we desire to have that engagement, we desire to open it up? Um, what does that mean for us? And so um, Jess, I'm doing a time check with you tell me yeah. tell me how we're tell me how we're doing I think we're we're okay and we can just be kind of informal as we wrap up because this we're so small um and I I wanted to just mention something that Lisa had asked a great question about you know we le we're learning a lot about the why and it's harder to get the what you know the stuff that will actually help teachers in the classroom and one of the things we do have there is stuff um and I can paste a couple of links in here in a second that um we actually are providing to our program sites for PDIs, um, but happy to share with you as well. They're just off, they're not ABE resources, they're external resources, but they have a lot of great stuff that's very focused on classroom use and practical. Um, but the other kind of big aha that I've had throughout my learning journey in this domain has been that um, it's not so much about the what and the strategies as it is a mindset shift, because it's more about the approach that what are the questions we're asking as we begin to teach some curriculum. So what are we asking about our students? What are we asking, you know, what do we know about our students? And if we don't know, how are we finding out? Um, and then questions like, you know, what narrative am I centering right now? Or have I been centering? And are there others that I haven't been considering? So just those kinds of questions that if you, you know, I've, I almost have started to think of them as a list for myself 
as I'm developing professional development resources to kind of walk myself through that forces me to think about things differently than I might if I were just jumping in. And I say that because that was frustrating to me because um, I wanted it to be a sort of a more of a checklist. And um, so there was a great quote and I, I, I'm trying to remember who said it, but um, I think it was from one of the modules we had that said, uh, culturally sustaining pedagogy is not a teaching guide or a set of lesson plans. It's an approach to the craft of teaching. And um, I think that's where, you know, I think sometimes we need some tools to get us started and then we need to kind of back out and be thinking about those mindset shifts. And that's where I'm kind of at right now personally. And I, and I think that that's, um, that's the tension is that you're always kind of moving between those two things. So that, that's exactly right, Jess, that, that and what Lisa said, we need some sort of resources with some beginning actual things that we can model in our PDIs for our teachers that would then open up the conversation. But I don't even know what those starter things are. So that's why we need something to help us. And I think that's really, so one of the things that, that we're doing right now is um, we're creating tools for engaging in um, the process of as we're planning, as we're lesson planning, what questions are we asking? Um, what tools are we using? How are we using them? And so as we're, we're engaging in, you know, our, our, our regular, what we know how to do, right? As teachers, educators, coaches, what we know how to do, how do we begin to shift in that mode that we might kind of get stuck in, that, we, that we're so used to and we're, we know how to do it very well um, and, and find ways to kind of integrate um, that questioning so that that mindset is not, oh my gosh, I'm taking on something new, but, and I am taking on something new, but I'm doing, um, I'm going through the processes that, that I know kind of, that I know how to do, but maybe in a different way. Jess, did you want to, and I know we're, we're tight on time. So we wanted to kind of close off with, um, acknowledging that, there are a ton of things that we want to consider. One is this idea of um, what kind of challenges or barriers um, or pushback might we have? And one of them is our training, right? What kind of training um, is available to us? Um, how are we, who are we engaging with? How are we engaging with them? Um, things like our time, right? Looking at our place-based um, uh, issues that are happening either in our school or in our local context. And then what kind of professional learning support um, do we have available to us? And so we're considering that. And then also shifting and, and asking, um, what kind of things would you like to see? And so we've heard on this call that we'd like to see some models of um, kind of walking through that, that lesson pr process, um, support for PDIs. But if there are other resources um, that are important to you that uh, we can support you, that we can support the program sites with. Um, we'd like to know more about what you're thinking that you need. Yeah, so I'm going to wrap us up, first of all, by saying a huge thank you to Alyssa for being with us today. Just really appreciate your time. And for everyone who joined us today, um, we, we know how hard it is to make time, especially right now, this time of year. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to add that we will be sharing these resources and uh, others with folks who registered for this roundtable. If you would like Alyssa to come and work with your site, then if you are a teacher, contact your ABE program site and let them know. If you are a program site, Karen, um, you can reach out to us at the program office and we can book some time uh, with you and Alyssa to work with your program site around some of our materials. And we have started to build in PDI materials, um, a PDI session that you can actually do that work with your teachers around these questions. Um, so to the short answer is that next steps for us is the program office is that we will be sharing these master teacher fellowship projects. We are renewing and integrating these practices into all of our new materials moving forward and also trying to move backwards and add some supports um, in previously published materials that we use um, to make it easier for program sites to adapt them and to make them more culturally responsive. And again, our goal
goal is to keep building our own capacity and our program sites capacity and our teachers capacity to continue to grow this uh, mindset. And so it's a work in progress, but we're happy to be on this journey together. And thank you all so much for being part of the journey and being willing to have this conversation today. So thank you for joining us. We'll share the slide deck and the recording with you um, as soon as they're ready. And thanks a lot. Have a great day and have a great holiday season for those of you Absolutely. who Absolutely. And we've got a quick survey. Two minutes. Oh, we do. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, My goodness. Was that Put it in the chat, form? quick. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, okay. I forgot about the survey, Alyssa. It's terrible. So if you could just uh, answer that survey, there are optional questions, so you can answer one or all of them. Um, we'd be most grateful. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.